Maria. Edwin Howell, what's up, Edwin? Just there, just there. Alibu. I'm good. What's up, Allison? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. good. How's everybody? I'm good. I, I, I love to see my little sister. I love to see my sister. I love you. You're beautiful. What's up? This background music is kind of low. What's that? I shouldn't think.
Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Latasha Brown, and I'm the program manager for the Shirley Chisholm Center for Equity Studies and the co-director of the State University of New York SUNY and the University of the West Indies UE Center for Leadership and Sustainability Development. Welcome to the second annual community engagement lecture series entitled Calypso and Soka, The Sound of a People. This event is presented by the SUNY, the SUNY UE Center for Leadership and Sustainability Development and the Center for Equity Studies. Let me give you an overview for the Chisholm Center for Equity Studies. It's a name in honor of the Brooklyn native who was the first African-American woman in Congress in 1968 and the first woman of African descent to seek the nomination for presidency in 1972. Her motto and title of her autobiography, On Bot, On Boss, illustrates her outspoken advocacy for challenging the power structure during her seventh term in the U.S. House of Representatives. To give you more insight, the center will be based at the State University of New York Empire State New Brooklyn location, which is located on 55 Hanson Place. The mission of the center is to examine the, pres the present day cultural, political, and societal inequalities that derive from the legacy of colonialism and black enslavement. The center will conduct solution-oriented interdisciplinary research, offer community-based educational programming, as well as really inform policy to drive social change. At this point in time, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Anne-Marie Grant, to discuss the SUNY UE Center for Leadership and Sustainability Development. Thank you. Hello and good evening, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our community engagement lecture series. And here we are talking about Calypso and Soka, the sound of a people. As Latasha said, my name is Anne-Marie Grant and I'm the co-director for the SUNY UE Center for Leadership and Sustainable Development, an institution that was founded in 2016, which sought to establish a place where people from the Caribbean diaspora, people from the region and New York State could come together in a forum to discuss issues that predominantly affect the, the mobility and progress of, of the minority populations in these places. The Center for Leadership and Sustainable Development is therefore a direct response to the critical need to increase leadership skills and capacity opportunities for full civic participation amongst young people, as well as mature individuals, wise sages that make up our population. Located in the United States, as in New York, the center is focused on herbal renewal for minority populations. The center is therefore a deliberate effort to combine interests that focus on impactful and productive engagement. Briefly, our primary objective at this point in time is to focus on the creation of academic programs that will lead to leadership and sustainable development. And we now have uh, an advanced certificate in leadership and sustainable development, which, which we started last year. And we are proud to announce that in this fall, we'll be, we will be offering the master's program. And this program is gonna be offered jointly by SUNY Empire State and the University of the West Indies Open Campus. Get your applications ready. It's gonna be worth your while. We also focus on solution-oriented research that face that that looks at issues facing the Caribbean and its diaspora. Uh, we intend to establish an expert network with, think, with a think tank that is focused on issues germane to the development of minority populations. And of course, and more importantly, we are focused on advocacy, which is what this particular event is about, bringing to you information about music that is developed in the Caribbean that speaks to the journey of the Caribbean peoples and peoples of African descent. Next slide, please. In 2009, we hosted a successful program. Um, we had a lecture series which spoke about the Caribbean music industry. Our special guest was um, Professor Carolyn Cooper. And we also had a film series. More information about what took place in 2019 is available because if you missed it, we do have all of this archived. 
the information that we provided for the presentation on the Caribbean music industry, which focused on reggae music, next slide please, was very, very informative, very exciting. As you can see, our special guest, Dr. Carolyn Cooper, was in full flight to a very attentive and, and, and enthusiastic audience. We were thrilled to have for that event the following panelists, in addition to Dr. Cooper. Next slide, please. Kathy Bar Christy Barber, manager for our other special guest, Spraga Benz, formerly known as, or really official name is Carlton Grant, popularly known as Spraga Benz. On our panelists, we also had Mr. Bobby Clark OD, who is a media operator and very much in the promotion of reggae and dance hall music. We had a vibrant audience, as I mentioned before, and you have there one of the icons of the Caribbean music industry, Pat Chin. And she was in full stride making a point. Next slide, please. Climate action is something that is at the very heart of the people of New York and the people of the Caribbean. For us, climate is not something which is only focused on environment. It is at the very soul of our existence. For the people of the Caribbean, it affects their daily lives, the small island developing nations. They get, they, they, they are, it is involved in their economic fortunes and misfortunes as the case may be. And so the Caribbean, in particular, the University of the West Indies in collaboration with SUNY has been an advocate about climate action long before it became the flavor of the month. An event which we hosted on Friday, 20 September in 2019 was a, was a very um, impactful symposium in which we had uh, global partnerships from the multilateral, bilateral and local educational institutions who presented their ideas, perspectives on the different activities that could take place as it relates to climate action. Again, a lot of that information is on our website. Next slide, please. Those are just some images from the event and we invite you to visit our website. Next slide, please. I'm rushing because I really want us to get to the best part of the program. You did not join this webinar to hear me talk. So without further ado, I just want to say welcome to our panelists. We have uh, Professor Brian Copeland, who is the principal of the St. Augustine campus of the University of the West Indies and our Pro Vice Chancellor. We have Etienne Charles, name speaks for himself. Um, he is also the um, Associate Professor at Michigan State University. We have none other than the Queen of Soka, the beautiful, the lovely Alison Hines, who is the only female panelist. I wanna give a big shout out to women. Yes, Alison, go there. Um, our program today is going to be moderated by none other than the one and only number one DJ of the number one program on Caribbean radio in the Northeast, David Levy. Rocking you, rocking you. Let me say that, David, before you do. And we are particularly pleased to have Edwin Howell. He is the a and and distribution manager of VP Records. These panelists who are at the pinnacle of their particular, their chosen field of industry will tell you a little bit about themselves. And so you don't need to hear from me if they're here to speak for themselves. Um, and just before I go, I just want to tell you, we want to hear from you. So please contact us, contact Dr. Latasha Brown. Her contact email is on the slide, co-director SUNY UWE Center for Leadership and Sustainable Development. We're giving out all her digits so you can call her. We want to hear from you. My, my email and telephone number is there, as well as we invite you to visit our website. Again, ladies and gentlemen, all of this information is gonna be posted on the SUNY UE Center Center's website. We are excited about it. We wanna thank you for joining and get ready for a really, really wonderful program. Our first presenter this evening will be my PVC. So please forgive me if I take a little time to introduce with a lot of glee and enthusiasm, Professor Brian Copeland, Pro Vice Chancellor for the University of the West Indies and the principal of the St. Augustine campus of the UWI in the Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Over to you, Professor Copeland.
I'm sorry, coming to the first card now, so there, I'm not unmuting. <laughs> so I just repeat uh, thank you again um, for, for inviting me to this and a special welcome to, to my panelists. Um, I, have, uh, um, I have to be careful because I'm sure the audience say one of my favorite superstars here <laughs> today. I have to be able to walk out from the building. <laughs> and Mr. Etienne Charles, who um, certainly has uh, turned heads um, on the music scene uh, locally and elsewhere. Uh, Mr. David Levy and Mr. Edwin Howell, um, um, welcome. Oh, sorry, good afternoon. Is that my show? Uh, good afternoon. Um, I need to get um, uh, to. I need you to allow me to to share my screen. Oh, great. Um, I will share this one. I have to be careful what I share. And I think you're all seeing it now. Um, so I, I chose today to talk about steel pan technology. I know that uh, the, 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 the conversation here is about music and Soka and Calypso, um, art forms in Trinidad and Tobago. My, my work in the past has been looking at technology and how we could improve steel pan technology in particular. It does dovetail so nicely with the art that is amazing and it speaks a lot to what we need to do in our educational sector in terms of how we dovetail the arts, the humanities, and science and, and technology. I, I am not a musician. I play all of eight songs. I start off on piano and then I move it to pan and I've been on eight songs for the last eight years. So um, a lot of my work has been on appreciated how, how music um, uh, dovetails with with, uh, with with technology. I was a DJ at one point in time. I tried my best, but those were the days of wax um, records and so on. Um, and I got fed up when four o'clock in the morning, I'm alone there taking down music boxes. So um, I gave that up and focused on my studies. Um, this talk is going to focus on the three uh, um, uh, pillars of sustainability. And you, you nicely mentioned, and really the whole issue of climate change uh, that speaks to the ecological aspect, which is one pillar, but we also have for survival of the community, um, the whole issue of the economic and the social um, aspect as, um, as well. And I have to say even now, before I get fully into this, that um, a critical part of, of this has to do with the arts and culture. Uh, too often we, we sideline it, um, perhaps in the rush to make sure we survive but long-term survival, long-term growth of any society depends on, on art and its artists, uh, music, culture, the like. And, and I can say that because, as you see here, I, I grew up in a, what we call an internet called a mass house. My father's name was Mark Copeland, very well known in the carnival band um, uh, sort of activity in Trinidad and Tobago in the 60s and 70s. Um, I mean, he died making mass, actually. Um, but this is, is one of his portraits in the 1960s. But that's just the context. So I, I grew up when other kids were studying for exams. I would wake up in the morning with sequins all over my bed and, and all over me um, because work was going on a pace the night before. Now, this article came out last week. So maybe it was a good thing that we had to postpone the last um, session, and Marie and Natasha, because it came out just after. And it hit the nail on the head. This is what I've been working, looking at for all of my working life. This is from Rafik Shah, an article he posted in Sunday Express last week. Um, Opportunities Lost was the name of the article. And it says basically that we have failed to recognize our own creative creativity, the genius that resides in our people. And we'll see that we have not capitalized on that. I'm, I'm taking his words. So there's a so it's supposed to be an SIC in there. And in Trinidad Palance, he says, all we do is to pan, panorama, and recognize the instrument only at carnival time, when we should be exporting factory perfected pans, pan tuners, pan innovators. But then we talk about the diversification of the economy. It's no secret, really, that um, we're not well known in the Caribbean for innovation um, driven entrepreneurship. We have a few examples, but it's not enough. Um, it exists then, but it's all too few. Instead, the small economies across the Caribbean, I call it Caribbean, by the way, have depended on ministries like tourism, uh, natural resource mining, oil, gas, gold in some instances, bauxite. But we look at the low return of investment and the scale. And, and, um, and these dominate the 
income earning, the foreign exchange earning in our countries. I'm talking about survival, so those of you looking for a full cultural exposition will forgive me. I think everything here is intertwined, and I've lived my life thinking that way. So in my view, this is what defines our third wellness, despite the large revenues that we've done in the near distant past. And there are all sorts of reasons why we're in this money. Um, Lloyd Best and others tackled it. Economists have looked at it. They use all kind of terminologies, Dutch disease, plantation economy, and the like. You hear those terms banded around. But whatever the reason, a major region-wide cultural shift is required. Um, so that we can more readily identify and exploit new opportunities, recognize and respect our artists across the Caribbean, and help them to develop their livelihoods, even as they, in return, through their work, help us to become innovative and develop powers. So you can find a better example on this and in the panel. I have here sort of a timeline to steel pan development, starting with the Tambu Bamboo way back in 1935. Uh, Pre-1935, I'm sorry, 1935, it was banned. You see these little curves coming up? Those shows show roughly when splits of activity have occurred in a particular area. So for Tambu Bamboo, in terms of the activity, it reaches its peak. Before 1935, I was banned by the officials because they, find, they found that um, the, the natives were making too much noise on the streets. That didn't stop us. We got tins and whatnot and, and, and beat them, especially around Carnival time. And um, DD there, CDD 1, 2, 3, that stands for Dominant Design. So out of all the activity, you got like a, a major focus occurring. Um, ping pongs came around somewhere around the 40s, pre-World War II. Um, when the war wasn't going on, the Americans came ashore in Trinidad. People know the story. They bought these 55 gallon oil drum. That was just right for, for uh, our, our forebears who were uh, playing different types of instruments, anything they could get their hands on percussively. And out of that, um, some say by accident, I won't even get into that argument, the steel pan was born. Um, interestingly, some of the early pans were tuned to a song. So they put the notes on there that put into a song. That's what they played. And then um, our geniuses, the tuners, got into the act. Uh, generally, on school, um, and between the 50s and 60s, a lot of um, activity took place. I'm showing here this image is that of um, Anthony Williams, who's still with us. Um, and he, in fact, um, developed a, a, a very, very um, in, uh, important type of instrument, um, a variation of the pan called the spider web, which is seen here. That's why it looks like that. And for the first time, um, music, music, musicians can recognize what's going on. The notes of an octave played out concentrically um, uh, on the instrument. And that's the first time that was done. Um, you also introduced a very important um, innovation in terms of the layout of the notes, which is the cycle of fourths and fifths. Um, the current form evolved thereafter, 1960s to 1970s. And of course, that's, that's what we see today. The main point here is that um, all of these activities you're seeing here are typical of any product that is growing from zero. And um, in this particular case, what has happened is that the growth of PAN uh, resulted from that, but then nothing happened after that. It was just used for fun, as Rafik Shah said, and it was forgotten after Carnival. Normally in other countries, what would have happened um, is that you would have, somewhere around this period here, um, 1950s, 60s, some of the guys with, who have investment potential would have recognized the opportunity and taken off on it. That did not happen. So the PAN industry is this today, the effort in moving it forward was not zero. It just was not enough. And that is our great concern. New paradigm is needed um, uh, for doing that. That's just summarizing what I said. Just a quick note on the fourth and fifth layout. If pans were laid out like this, which is on a chromatic scale like on a piano, um, C next to C sharp, next to D, E flat, and so on, it just would not sound good because the notes would leak into each other. And Etienne and, and um, Alison would know exactly what I'm talking about. You did a lot of this code. What Tony did is he said, oh, why don't we lay out in fourths and fifths, right? Which then looks like this. Look what happens to the black notes. These are the black notes on the piano. Look what happens to the black notes. They all move to one side. So that actually tells you that not only does it sound more pleasant, but you can take my word for it, mostly panty here, you hear a layout like this. It also is easier to play. Um, it, it's very natural, actually. And a lot of people have written on the fourth and fifth cycle and its impact on the human being. So this was significant. The first time I was put on a musical instrument, although the fourth and fifth was known in the musical world for quite a long time. Now, my academic colleagues will not forgive me if I do not um, introduce, um, uh, indicate some of the academic work that was done. My book for them 
is that, and to include myself, is that that work did not start until around the 70s, 30 years after the pan um, started its growth. And it took an Australian by the name of Ron Dennis here at the Faculty of Engineering to recognize that this was something that the scientific world needed to know something of and started to work on it. I've listed the papers here. Anyone who wants to get a list of them can, can contact me. The second one is important because Kariri, Caribbean Industrial Research Institution, got involved in looking at manufacture. Um, Richard McDavid, the uh, deceased, um, uh, he, he worked with us on the G-Pans. And down here in this list, you see one Bertie Marshall, who's one of our, our, our best tuners, um, also now no, deceased. We're going through that page right now. Of Conman in, in uh, Sweden, writing a book on the pan, first book I know about steel pan tuning. There is one in the Smithsonian Institute that was written in the 1960s, but that was a crude type of pan. Tom Rossing, I work with him, looking at acoustics. Brian Copeland, I and he, starting to look at uh, electroacoustic type pans, not enough time to cover all of it. I think Archer, Archer wrote an extremely detailed manual on the, the sands behind the, the steel pan. And uh, some more work done on metallurgy and all that. The last two are patents that pertain to, to what um, the rest of the talk will be about. Um, the, the problem then is why all this? Why did this happen? And we, we decided that, look, we need to pull together all of these strains of activity that occurred over the re very many years. A lot of children are still doing work, um, uh, uh, development work, hiding them under their, their beds, so to speak. And in 2006, um, at the, with the support of government, I'm sure they were actually with their, their um, involvement, their direct involvement, um, we formed the Steel Pan Industries Project with the objectives listed here, conducting research development and innovation in steel pan technology, establishing Trinidad Tobago as the undisputable world leader in steel pan technology, and therefore contributing, it's a big picture here, it's beyond pan, to the development of a stronger culture of technological innovation in Trinidad Tobago, which is needed for um, um, economic survival. Um, this was a major um, uh, intervention. It was formed primarily to treat with a request from the government to focus on research to improving the quality of the tenor pan. 29 notes, some notes not so nice to play, a little bit of lack of uniformity and all that. And we went after it with Gusto. I have to say the project is nowhere complete. We did come up with the next innovation, which is the, the g bands, uh, which are shown here. And the g bands are re-engineered forms of the traditional pan. Some of the research output is shown on the left. Um, these are actual 3D stand images of a pan as computer simulation of it. The acoustic radiation scene makes pretty picture, so scientists can get involved in art without even raising a bus stroke. It's not the best you can find, but it does grab the eye. But these, I, I can't explain it in the time I have, but this shows the radiation pit, um, patterns. This is work that was done at Northern Illinois University where Liam T is. Um, interestingly enough, these vibration patterns show how the skirt um, of the pan distorts and it does cause problems with the sound. Um, the sound needs to be tight. There's a lot of noise on the pan. And it's worse on the bass, so we have reinforcing elements on the G-Pan bass like this. This is the first G-Pan bass that was ever made. It's all chrome. That's the last time we chrome the pan. It's so really expensive. We have a trademark and the National Steel Symphony Orchestra. Every single pan that's there is a G-Pan. This is Bert Kelman, tuner of the basses, and some of the other pans in the G-Pan lineup. They're just four ranges, and uh, you can see he looks very, very happy there. He's, a, he's in glee, um, he's in glee uh, tuning this, this, um, this pan that you see here. Um, the next line I have speaks to, um, well, this is my favorite part of the project, and um, you have to give me a, oh, there we go. Um, this is the phi, and the phi is a complete deviation from the traditional pan. It is not made from metal, it is an electronic device. Um, there's uh, four inventors, uh, one passed away, unfortunately. I keep seeing that through this tour. Um, it has uh, all of the features of what you might see on a conventional keyboard. And this was done, uh, conceived of way back in 1985, I think it was, uh, by Keith Maynard. His name is listed there first. Uh, what um, this does for the panist is basically give them a broader canvas to perform on. And if I have time, I'll show you a video where, where that is very clear. Uh, if, if had it been launched in time, had we the mechanisms in the country to move this forward, and I have to say one of the mistakes we made is probably sticking, trying to pull too much in the, uh, uh, from the Caribbean to develop this, but one of the mistakes we made is not pulling in from the, from the world, so to speak. But had we done it, it would have been the first instrument with a touchscreen display. So with this, you can play anything 
balance, harps, horns, keyboards, anything, but where the planners moves. We got into market initiatives, so Boomsy Shop, many of you would know, um, has an album out, it's on iTunes. Um, Darren Shepard and his Fusion Steel, there's a, a lovely album out. All of them using the five on Boomsy's album, every single instrument is done by five, from the background bands right up the front line bands. A lot of work done with kids. This is a workshop in Enterprise, one of our more challenging years in Trinidad and Tobago. And it shows um, Earl Philip that we made appearances at PASIC. This is the Percussive Art Society International Convention. And it was a great hit there. We have just not been able to move it. We have a bank or actually that has endlessly been using the file uh, right up to, to today. Uh, Nikki Minaj, um, her Pauli Alarm video, you see how much views we had there. This is the, the 22nd intro on that um, one. And um, that was a great marketing um, plus simply because we didn't pay for it. This is, uh, I will run this and keep it short because time is running. So this is uh, Natasha Joseph playing Sunday morning, Maroon 5. This was way back in 2009. And she's synthesizing uh, anything that is not a part I'm going to have to, 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 to move forward on this because the next slide is actually um, the end. I didn't want to, to delay the meeting too much on it. I'd like to thank you, Anne Marie, Natasha, colleagues on the panel, for allowing me this time to, to speak about um, steel plant technology and its potential impact on economic diversification. Thank you very much. Wow, that's a lot to unpack. Thank you so much, PVC just to put you on notice that this is going to be the first of a couple of things that you're going to be asked to take the story to the next to the next chapter so stand by watch this space ladies and gentlemen um that was certainly interesting and i'm sure we learned a lot more than what we thought we knew about the pan um our next panelist is none other than etienne charles Thank you so much, Etienne, for being here. And I'm sure many of you will know Etienne as a recording artist. He's, of course, the associate professor at Michigan State University. And he has far more to him than what, you, what we've just talked about. Etienne, over to you. Thank you, Anne Marie. Good afternoon to the distinguished panel. Good afternoon to everyone who is 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 tuned in thank you for checking this out um i'd like to start by by really quickly remembering um the the, the passing of toots hibbert and of course rupert Philo, the king swallow who both passed away sometime between yesterday and this morning um so i have been charged with speaking on the role of academia and the artist in the discussion um and so as a as a musician I was born and raised in Trinidad, and I grew up, ironically, um, listening to Dr. Copeland speak about the steel pan, which just brought back numerous memories because I grew up basically in a pan yard. I grew up in Phase 2's pan yard. So I grew up, you know, right up under Butch Kelman, right up under Roland Harrigan, right up under Bertie Marshall, right up under Dudley Dixon, right up under Boxy Sharp and East Hadid, and uh, Ray Harmer was my Spanish teacher at Fatima. So I could go down a long list of of the steel pan history, but Dr. Copeland did that so perfectly. Um, so what I'm going to talk about specifically is the artist's role, technically as an academic, um, but in an unofficial way, simply because when you think of academia, a lot of times people think about, you know, master's, bachelor's, PhD, doctorate, university, etc. But when I think of academia, I think specifically from the, the concept of the griot, which is the concept of, of our ancestors, um, for those of us who are, you know, African descendants of, of the, the enslavement trade or, or post-enslavement. And um, so the griot tradition is very rich. A griot is basically one who, with, one who holds information, who holds and tells the history of a place, whether it's a region, whether it's a culture. And, and that griot tradition immediately passed when it got to Trinidad. It, you know, it became the Chantuel tradition as well. And Calypso, which is what we're here to talk about, Calypso Soka, as the sound of a people, um, really comes out of what we call the Chantuel tradition, which happened during the Kalenda um, uh, 
traditional pastime. Kalenda is what what people also know know as bois or stick fighting, and um, specifically the 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 chantwell would sing in a way to comment on what was happening during the stick fight. In addition to using that as a way to push the fighters to continue this, there's a constant dialogue and constant conversation going on in the calendar. Um, there's conversation, improvisational happening between the the lead drummer, which we call the cutter, and the the fighters, or we call them also dancers. So there's a there's an improv there's an improvisational conversation happening there. There's also improvisational comp- um, conversation happening between the chantwell and the stick fighters. And on top of that, there's a whole group of people singing what we call a love way, which is the chant that you normally hear. So the love way eventually became what we know as the chorus in Calypso. And the what was improvised verse eventually became written verses. Um, but what the improvised verses initially became first was what we call extempo or extemporaneous singing. Um, it was always a clandestine um, activity during the days of enslavement and post-enslavement um, due to the British banning um, the outlaw drums in 1884. It was called the Peace and Preservation Act of 1884, which outlawed any drum, stick, or weapon in public and also groups of 10 people or more. Um, a lot of people don't know um, that in, in, I think it was October, or September, October of 1884, as a result of that ordinance, which banned the drumming, um, the Jose, uh, the Jose procession that happens every year in Trinidad, which is a Muslim pastime, the Jose procession was broken up by the British police, and it was a, it was a, it was a gathering of of African descendants and Indian descendants, Christians, Orisha, and Muslim, and what ended up happening was the British decided to start firing into the crowd with their rifles and. Um, it's known as the Jose Massacre of 1884. Um, and from that time, people kind of, you know, slow down on drumming. And that's when bamboo really became, that's when bamboo became prevalent. They started going out into the woods. And of course, as Professor Copeland added on that bamboo was then outlawed. We went into metal and we went into steel. The important thing about that is right there, you see the constant sound of resistance. And also what, you know, Kim Johnson refers to as the audacity of the Creole imagination. Um, that's one of the sayings that I always think about, especially now doing during COVID-19 and, you know, I'm no longer touring. I'm trying to think about well, how am I able to continue to communicate with my ancestors musically and how am I able to continue to communicate with, with my fan base and to find new people to tell the story of what we do, which leads to my next point. Um, the artist... Um, as a musician, my role is specifically to continuously study history and current society and their events to represent those stories and traditions in my music and also in my films. Um, I see Carnival as a constant dialogue between a society, its past and its present. And I see Calypso and Soka as the soundtrack for that. Um, it is not the only soundtrack for that. Kalenda still happens. Um, Jab Malasi is still happening. And there are many different um, musical forms that happen during Carnival that 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 are that are outside of the calypso tradition but they they naturally have exchanges due to the improvisational form and due to the the use of rhythm on it and so if anybody has any questions about anything i'm really glad to answer but i was trying to keep it really short um and so that's what i would have to say about the artist as an academic in calypso and soca well thank you so much for that. And we also want to acknowledge that we borrowed with your permission, the title of this evening's presentation. And I'm gonna, if, if we have any copyright issues, um, please have a word with my co-director. We're fine, uh, we're fine. She gave us permission, so. We'll but yeah, the, the, the name was from my album, Carnival, yes, The Sound yes, of a People. Exactly. So we just wanted to give a shout out to the album as well. Thank you. So, so, so Calypso and Soka, The Sound of a People. Um, we want to talk a little bit now um, about why we have this series, the lecture series. And so I'm going to invite my co-director, uh, Latasha, just to say that before we bring up our only female panelist. So going back to the SUNY UE Center for Leadership Sustainability Development, 
alongside of the Chisholm Center for Equity Studies, we realized that in order to incorporate um, academic and non-academic alike, we needed to really have a focus on culture and cultural innovation because it speaks to those um, struggles and moments in the past and present to capture the, the essence of the African diaspora. And so the thought behind this was to really tap into an area of study as well as those who are practitioners in the field for them to really come to a space and under the umbrella of um, COVID-19, a digital space to talk about some of the, the political, social and cultural difficulties that folks of African de descent has experienced throughout time. And so with this particular event, as my colleague has already said, last year we focused on Jamaica, particularly reggae music dance hall. And then this year in lieu of um, the fact that we could not gather in public spaces, carnival and the sound of the people was just most appropriate to really kind of break up some of the, the trials and tribulations of being inside or having cabin fever and then having an opportunity to discuss the rootedness of the music, um, not just in the Caribbean, but how it exploded to um, the diaspora. So back to you, Anne-Marie. Thank you so much, Latasha. Our next presenter, as I mentioned before, is our only female panelist and we are really thrilled and delighted that Alison could join us today. Um, we've, we're, we're all disciples. I can't think of another word. We're all disciples mm -hmm. of your music. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and so it is my pleasure. And, and on behalf of Tuni Yui and, and certainly, uh, to welcome you, Alison. So much I, I i appreciate the intro <laughs> that was that was really nice um i'd like to say a special good afternoon to everyone that is uh connected right now everyone that is that is uh within this forum uh of course to my fellow colleagues uh fellow fellow panelists um i'm very happy to have been asked to be a part of uh, this symposium because as an as a a performer um, I have built my brand and built my career within soca music specifically um, I can sing or perform basically any type of music but soca has become such an integral part of, of who I am as a Caribbean woman, as a woman of color, um, and being a part of, of this world. And through my years, let me take a, little, a quick, quick trip back in time to my years uh, with Square One. And we started out as, you know, young people in love with music, period. And um, I had entered a local talent competition and Anderson, young blood, well, he was young blood at the time because he was young, <laughs> now he's just blood. And, um, but he was the person that really encouraged me to um, go into this competition. And I was very, very shy, extremely so. So I would not have entered for myself. And I got to the finals, I placed third. And he said to me, 
you know, we have a band and we're looking for a female vocalist. Would you be interested? And that was, that was my dream. And um, fast forward, we became, we were in a hotel circuit. And then we worked our way onto the club circuit here in Barbados, <clears throat> excuse me. And then we started recording. And we were on Eddie Grant's uh, label at one point, Ice Records, uh, starting to do some recordings and so on with him. And then we kind of got to a point where we felt like we needed to, we wanted to step out on our own. Um, with, for all that we learned from, from Eddie Grant and, and all that he taught us, um, we felt that we needed to kind of take, take the reins and, and just, you know, go with the, the direction that we needed to go. And so we started, you know, recording independently and putting stuff out there. And uh, when Ragamuffin was created, that was my first major hit in terms of the Caribbean as a whole and then spreading further afield. And when Ragamuffin came on the scene, it was very, very different to what had been coming out from before, predominantly from Trinidad and Tobago. And at that time, it was um, super blue and um, Tambu and it was and it was jump and wave and flag in the air and rag and flag and Iowa and all of that. And Terry Arthur, Terry, Mexican Arthur, he came into the band and he was the musical director. And he wrote this song, he wrote Ragamuffin. And he kind of had his finger on the pulse of the youth at the time and what was happening. And he felt, you know what, we need to go another direction. We need to figure, we need to, we need to kind of log into what's happening with young people at this point. And Ragamuffin was born. And when the song came out, it completely just took over. And from there, we knew that we had work to do because that was my first big hit um i won road march that year i was the first woman to in the history to win road march and then we had to keep going from there so soka actually and at that point soka was going through a change it was going through a change in terms of the change of the guard but it was also going through a musical change because we were starting now to fuse soca with reggae, therefore Raga Soka came into being. Um, and we were starting to look for different ways to be able to uh, make soca music, keep it, keep it ours, but still, you know, kind of give it that, that breadth and that acceptance in other markets as well. And then the other way once we started to get this music out there and we had songs like Ay 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 and Kitty Cat and Mannequin and all of these tracks, of course, Togetherness came into being and the absolutely, I know, classic Faluma came into being. And Faluma, again, was another song that just took the market completely. It, it took us by surprise because... We had only learned that song because we were going on tour to Suriname. And that was the most popular local song at the time. And we performed it at our sold out concert. And um, the people absolutely lost their minds. And we came back to Barbados and we were on the club circuit and we decided to continue to perform this song. People fell in love with it. And we eventually recorded it with the, with the original group. Uh, and the original singer recently passed away. And we are forever grateful for that song, for Luma. And we just kept going from there and started touring. And the music and the, the gospel of soca 
was spreading even more. And what I'm really happy about as the Caribbean soca queen is carnival now has spread so many to so many parts of the world. And it's because of the music. It's because of soca music. It's because of what people feel and, and, and how they feel when they hear the music and they get carried away with everything. And so we have Berlin Carnival, we have Ibiza, we have, um, of course, we have Notting Hill, we have Labor Day, but there are so many other carnivals that have popped up since then over the past 10 years or so. That's an amazing thing. That's an amazing phenomenon. And I am really pleased that I have had the opportunity to be a part of this spread of soca and this growth. But we still have more to do. We still have more growing to do. We still have more developing to do. Um, we still have to make sure that soca, when it really hits, um, uh, when it hits uh, mainstream in a really big way, that it's still our music, that it's still music of the Caribbean and not so changed that we don't even recognize it anymore. So we have to make sure and hold on to it and claim it as ours and love it and believe in it. I believe in soca. And so many of my counterparts believe in soca music. And we all have our part to play as West Indian people, people of West Indian descent, that we make sure that soca just continues to grow, continues to develop, and continues to evolve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice. I'm glad I was muted because I was shouting out, yes, girl, and that is not appropriate for this venue and for this particular event, especially with one of my bosses here, That's but true. I was shouting out inside and out, so I'm glad I was muted. I want to thank you so much, and, and again, we tried to just put on screen while you were speaking some images from some of your, your past creativity and, and your work. And, and we're just reminding our listeners and our viewers, wherever they are, to put some questions to Alison, to or all your other panelists, we have Mr. Howell to come, and we have our moderator with some questions, so that so that they can be addressed to um, yourself, Professor Copeland, Etienne Charles, um, Edwin, who's going to speak, and and David will be moderating. Again, thank you so much, Queen Soka Queen of the Caribbean. Thank you. After that breathtaking conversation and sharing that you just did. We want to talk to Mr. Edwin Howell because he is sitting at the place of the distribution of this music, soca, calypso. Um, and so in this new age, when, when everything is the way that we're having it now in the digital form, we're excited to hear what he has to say because I was born in the age when you had a 45, no, let me stop. Uh, Mr. Howell, over to you, sir. Because that's- Good dating. afternoon and- I want to thank you all for inviting me here this afternoon to be a part of this panelist. Um, soca music, um, my favorite genre, of course. Um, I'm from Barbados um, and I grew up listening to soca. And when I came to VP, um, I was like, they called me the specialist. But um, we started a thing called Soca Gold back in 1997, to be exact. Myself, um, a guy named Ryan Andrews, and a gentleman by the name of Frank Choi started Soca Gold back in 1997. And one of the reasons for so starting Soca Gold back then was um, back in the day, you used to hear from Byron Lee and Lesson Paul. And a lot of people would have think that Byron Lee and Lesson Paul was the originator of these Calypso of Soka tracks, not knowing that these other artists are actually the originals, not the duplicates. So Soka Gold came in to be um, the series that everyone could get all the hits for Carnival, Crop Over, and so forth. So we started out and 
started in 1997, and it's become the top soccer compilation and the longest running soccer compilation right now. It's the award-winning soccer compilation. And then we also uh, branch off to another compilation, which is called Soccer Zone. Now, some of the artists that I have worked with in the Soka Gold genre, I mean series, um, that broke out and cross over to sign into major labels and stuff is like people like Rupert Clark, Kevin Little, you know, stuff like that. Um, but the reason for the Soka Gold still is that um, you have people from the Caribbean diaspora that is living overseas like in Europe and so forth. And they would like to um, get those music. And sometimes they cannot get those music in those countries that they're living at. So Soko Gold now, they'll be able to get it off of the Soko Gold compilation because a lot, as you know, a lot of us comes from the Caribbean and we might not have the papers to go back and stuff like that. And we're missing our carnivals and stuff. And, Sometimes somebody would make a copy of a CD or cassette and give it to us, but we want to have our own thing. So we started off with Soka Gold to be that pillar right there. So we have on Soka Gold, not only for Trinidad now, we started to branch into other countries like Antigua, Barbados, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, St. Kitts, Grenada. You know, a lot of the the Soka Calypso countries, as they were call it, small islands. So we started to branch off into these countries and look for the talent from these countries and mix it up. So now you're not only having the hits from Trinidad. So if you have 18 songs on this compilation, out of the 18 songs, you have eight from Trinidad, which is the top eight Calypso songs from Trinidad. And then the next 10 now are from these other small islands that also have bigger tracks. Cause like for instance, you might, you might hear about a Bernie play from Antigua, but you don't really know them. So now by having it on Soko Go, the audience is getting a chance now to know these other artists. I, I, and by getting to know these artists now, we started on our 10th anniversary, we started to do a DVD into the Soko Go. So now, with the DVD now, not only the audio, you'll be getting video now of images of your favorite soccer artists because some of these artists might not have visas, they cannot travel. But now you're in Europe and you're getting your soccer gold compilation and you get to watch these DVDs with your favorite artists performing now like Faye Lyons. Now, she's one of my artists that I signed recently. I signed her a couple of years back along with her husband, Bungie Gali. And we know that Bungie had a big crossover hit with a track called Differentology. And that Differentology was huge. We did a joint uh, venture with Sony Music with that compilation. So Soka Gold opens a lot of doors for a lot of, lot of, lot of Soka artists out there. I mean, I get so much um, demos, emails and things every single day with different um, artists wants to know how can how can I work with them? How can VP take their, their, their tune to the next level? They want to be the next Rupee. They want to be the next Edwin Neal with Alison Hines, Marshall Montana, Bungie Garlic. You know, everybody wants to be a big star. Not saying that some of them don't sound good. Now, they got some artists that I would advise, I would say, listen, you got a good song. Your voice, is, your voice might not be the perfect voice for, to sing this track. Why don't you try to give this track to another artist that can do justice to this track? You get your credit the same way, you get your name out there the same way, but now you'll be getting your name out there as a writer. And that's one of the things I would try to advise people to do. And when they do that, I try to put them on Soka Goal also, or if I don't put it on a Soka Goal, we put them on Soka Zone. Now, not diverting from Soka Goal or Soka Zone. Now, I started another compilation at VP called Soka 101. Now, the Soka 101 now is the classics, taking you back now 
to some of the foundation soca from the late 80s or um, late 80s, late 70s, you know, and 90s and up. Now with these classics, you will have like a Byron Lee on there with like Tiny Whiny. Now, a lot of people don't know that um, the late Arrow, his brother, um, Justin Cassell, was the, was the writer for Tiny Whiny. I mean, Byron Lee was the one that put it out, but it wasn't written by Byron Lee. It was written by a monstruction. And also, um, Burning Flames was also involved in this. So it was written between Antigua and Montserrat. Now, saying that, there's a lot of, of, of talent down in the islands so when so when you try to school people about the genre, you try to like show them some of the the classics tunes because like people could all uh, relate to the Byron Lee. They knows the the um, dollar wine ten cent five cents ten cents dollar. They know those tunes. So when you when you try to introduce them to soca, you will introduce them with some of these classics. And they will say, yes, I remember hearing that growing up as a kid. Listen to WLIB, my parents on a Saturday mornings will be cleaning the house and I'll be hearing these tunes. So soca music and VP records, you know, is very important because VP records is the longest Caribbean owned company and they're the only one I can get the products out there. Not because I'm working for VP Records or anything, but they can get the product out there to places that a lot of independent producers and distributors cannot get them to. I mean, nowadays now, you might get your stuff on Apple, you get your stuff on um, Amazon, Spotify, and stuff like that. But having a label behind you, you get it on there much faster. Now, you might go onto iTunes and you're trying to search for Soka Goal or Soka 101 or any John, anything that says Soka, but you might see as a, a reggae category. And the reason for that, Soka doesn't have a genre as yet. And we are fighting right now to get Soka a genre. So once we get that Soka, once we get Soka a genre and BP Records is gonna be flying the flag high to get Soka a genre out there very soon. I mean, it's in my blood. I'm not going to give up until Soka gets a genre, Soka gets a Grammy. And with, with artists like Alison Hines, Faye Lyons, Marshall Montana, Bunjigali, Edwin Neawood, Rupi, you know, they can do it. And I strongly believe in this genre, and I will take that to my grave. That's it. Wow. Edwin, I don't know. Ladies and gentlemen, I am out of breath. It's been an absolutely fascinating conversation so far. I just want to say that part of the, the role and function of SUNY UE CLSD is for advocacy. And SOCA chronicles the journey of the lives of people of African descent, people of Latin descent, people of the Anglo-Saxon experience, all of whom are part of the some population of the Caribbean. The Caribbean is probably one of the most prolific genetic experiments in ethnicities that the world has ever seen. And so Soka is certainly um, there identifying our different experiences, our different life experiences and presenting it, us, presenting it to us in a way in which we can relate. So Edwin, we are with you. Part of our role is advocacy. We're with you. And when Soka gets that Grammy, we're going to be there to say, Thank you, Edwin. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome.
Ladies and gentlemen, you are reminded to send in your questions. You can put them in the chat if you're on Zoom. You can put them on Facebook if you are. Our next speaker is our moderator. I cannot introduce the number one DJ. That's just, just wrong. So uh -huh. let me just shut up because I'm an amateur. Um, Latasha insisted that I should do this, which is why I'm here. And so um, the professional is in the house. Let me give way. I want to thank you, David. I know that this is a very busy time for you and that this time in particular, you would normally be doing something else. So we are grateful. Um, you can introduce yourself. <laughs> I just want to let the audience know that... Wow, wow, thank you very much. Um, well, I've got something else going on uh, simultaneously, but you know what, we're doing what we're doing. I wanna thank you very much for having me. Uh, all, all of my guests on the panel, it's an honor and a pleasure being here with you. Um, wow, man, this is, this is crazy, this is amazing. Uh, okay, so here we go. I, this, I, I've been in music since 1984, 1985, we've been doing clubs. I went to City College and I was a, a part of a club and I, you know, club hours, I would give parties. And when I was going to school, <laughs> we, we, sometimes we were making more money at school than, than, than my teachers themselves when I went to City College because we used the club hours to do parties. And then we went all through the different colleges to do parties, right? And one thing led to another, and we ended up at a club called The Underground. The Underground was the first club of its kind in New York City, where we had all the stars on any given night. As a matter of fact, a documentary is being done right now about how Caribbean music rose in New York. And it talks about the underground, how the Mike Tysons, the Eddie Murphys, the Bobby Browns, all the, all the American stars came to the underground because they wanted the Caribbean experience. They wanted to experience dance hall and reggae and soca and calypso and house music, right? So in the underground, one of my out there was Shabba Ranks from Jamaica. We had Tiger, we had Lieutenant Stitchy, but one of the biggest out of Jamaica at that time was Shabba Ranks. And uh, we were summoned by Sony to find a reggae artist that they wanted to sign. And uh, at that time, Shabaranks was the best person in the position to sign that deal. So what we did, we went to Barbados and uh, we, we did Shabaranks in the National Stadium in Barbados and sold it out. And Sony flew down to see the show and the deal was, was going to go through. So here was the problem though, Sony did not want to sign Shabaranks because there was no major radio station playing Caribbean music. And the major radio stations didn't want to give anybody a show because there was no major record company to support the music. So what did we do and what did I do? We were able to do both deals. We signed Shabaranks to Sony. We were part of that deal and we were able to get the first Caribbean show playing Caribbean music on a Sunday on a major radio station at that time was 98.7 KISS FM. So we did both. So in 1990, the first Caribbean show playing Caribbean music on a major radio station in the number one market in the world for music and entertainment in New York City was our show on 98.7 KISS. Um, in six months, it went to number one. And then uh, after a year or two, BLS came to me and said, listen, you know, you grew up around BLS, which I did. I grew up around, I've been talking about LIB. I grew up around LIB, around Frankie Crocker and BLS. He was my, he was my inspiration. And uh, I signed a deal and went to BLS, right? Uh, it, I, I didn't leave KISS empty-handed. My, my program director at that time was a guy called Vinnie Brown. And Vinnie Brown said to me, hey, BLS is going to pay you this money. I'll be there soon. So I left him my DJ Sting International. At that time, most of you know, but no Sting International. Sting International is the guy who produced Shaggy 
um, it wasn't me and Angel and all these records. So he was my main DJ at the underground. So fast forward now, we came up, we were doing concerts. We were, we were bringing Marshall Montano into Madison Square Garden. For the first time, we were bringing Buju Banton into, into Madison Square Garden. We were selling out shows, we were doing things, Shabaranks is moving. And now, so that's a little, a little history about me. And now we're here. And what I wanna talk about today is the, the music business. So we have music and we have business of music. A lot of the times people concentrate on the music, but they don't concentrate on the business of the music. And sometimes the business of the music is more important than the art of the music. Because we've got a lot of times where you see artists that have made it and you go, well, they can barely sing. Oh, they can't sing as good as all these other people. Oh, they can't dance as good. Oh, they don't look as good, but they've got a number one hit and they've got a number one tour and they've got deals. And you wonder how it happens because they've got good managers. They've got good publicists. They've got all the people in place that takes care of the business of music. And I think with the Caribbean genre of music broken down into dancehall, into reggae, into soca, into calypso, into zouk, into kumpa, that a lot of times we are way in the background pertaining to the business of the Caribbean music. And I know sometimes you might hire a lawyer. Like, let me give you an example in the Caribbean world, right? In the Caribbean world, I hear a lot of Caribbean, I said, this is my manager. So I say, so what does your manager do for you? Oh, he takes my bookings. That's not a manager, that's a booking agent. A guy who sits down in a room and wait for the phone to ring and then say, here, this is your concert. That's not a manager, that's a booking agent. And what kind of booking agent is, is he or she if they're just sitting waiting for the calls to ring, phone to ring? You got to get out there and create opportunities. You can't wait for the phone to ring. A manager goes out there and finds opportunities, creates stuff. He's not only waiting for the phone to ring, right? So you, you will see it in the, in the genre of hip hop where a guy makes it from a neighborhood. He, he hires his best friend as the manager. He hires his other best friend as security. He hires, his, uh, and these people know nothing about it now. I'm not saying that you can't bring your people along with you, but when you have professional people with you and you can have your friends and your family members in there, but still it's an equal balance of friends, family, and people who know what they're doing. So I think it's, it's very important uh, in all these genres of music, in all the things that we're talking about to make sure to have the business of music as equal as the artistic value of the music, right? Because lots of times we have seen many of our very popular artists, they die and we have to bury them. They don't have a penny to bury themselves. This is not, you know, you, 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 you've got, you've got, artists that turn sick and they can't take care of themselves. And these are artists that have plenty of hits. These are artists that has an abundance of shows. And, and then the, the day is over, the financial scenario is dull. So if I can bring nothing more to this forum that we're doing today is to spread the word that we need to take care of the business of the music. And that's what it's called the music business, get a book, read it. There are lots of books up there. You've got, you've, got, you've got YouTube, you've got this, you've got that. You can learn from the mistakes of the MC Hammers and all these other artists who had millions and millions and millions of dollars, but threw it away and then end up broke. So uh, on behalf of everyone listening to the forum and looking at me and see what we're talking about, I encourage you to take care of the business of the entertainment, the business of the art, right? And because you have a manager, 
don't just put it all on your manager. Have an idea to make sure that your manager is in the pocket doing what study, learn, read, uh, see, look at other artists and see what happened to them and make sure that you don't fall into the same pit. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, rude boy, rocking you, rocking you. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, I think it's a very good um, note on which to depart into questions. We have 20 minutes, is it 20 minutes or 50? 25 minutes left for a forum. Um, the questions have been coming in fast and furious. I just want to tell you guys, we're also getting questions from Facebook, um, which we have been, I'm trying to type as fast as I can to send them over to David. David already has some questions from other individuals who he can begin to put to our panelists, but we just want to acknowledge the, our, our guests who are on the net from wherever you are in the Caribbean, in Europe, here in the United States, who are sending in questions. We have questions for Alison. We have questions for PVC Copeland. We have questions for Edwin. We have questions for Etienne. And some of our guests have even indicated, I want Etienne to answer this question. I want, this is for you, Alison. Um, and so, uh, David, over to you. I think you have some questions and I've been sending you some on text. Yeah. So do you want to take it away? And, and I will be feeding more to you um, given the time that we have left. And okay. My first question is for uh, Professor uh, Brian Copeland. Um, sorry, you, you spoke very eloquently on steel pan and, and, and how steel pan uh, came into existence and how it flourished and how it came to where it's at right now. But I remember about two or three years ago, there was talk about that. Yes, we did not, we did not own our own steel pan. We did not own our copyright to the steel pan. How much of that is false? and how much of that is true. And if it's true, were we able to correct having the ownership of steel pen? Okay, thanks, David. Um, the G-Pan was an attempt to retrieve control of the steel pen. Um, at the time when we started that project in 2006, pan was already 30 years old. You can't file a patent for pan. It's too late. It's out there, it's public domain. Everybody's doing it. Um, you can almost read their books on how to make pans and so on. Um, so what we did was said, said okay, let's kite up one notch um, and let's re-engineer the instrument. Uh, put some additional features on it, some, uh, treat with some of the problems that are there, and let's uh, patent that. And let that now be the flagship of a steel pan industry. So what that does is it brings strength um, to the, the core, the center where that is being produced, and it gives it a, a bit of a, more of a stronger brand. I mean, I heard Alison speak, spoke about brand in her context, and, and, um, and, and, uh, and she, she's so right. Brand is, is everything. It, uh, perception is everything. But also, um, within the GPAN patent, there, there's actually a, uh, we, were, we didn't even know it, but the patent that was filed, particularly in the US, they told us that they are ready to patent in one day. And that, in fact, if you were to really push it, uh, legally, you could in fact claim ownership of all plans using it. I've advised uh, people here don't use that clause. Um, the aim is to win. It's not to fight battles in court. And Lord knows that product I was on, only people made money for lawyers. Um, mm -hmm. So we have no <laughs> going back there at all. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to disrupt the space too much. But we didn't know that. Um, they actually said you have two pretends filing on one. So the answer is yes and no. You can't pretend the traditional plan. And it's still evolving. People are doing all kinds of things with it. But you can try to establish a, a new market based on one that you can control, which is what the GPAN was supposed to be. Thank you, Professor. Next question. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Charles, uh, do you think that, that the art of Calypso, Soka, Pan, uh, the, the learn of instruments should be instituted in elementary school? Um, it, it already is in many schools, I would say. I, I don't think it's in all, and I do think it should be. Um, education is key. I mean, the arts are the identity of a society, and the only way that they're passed on is through education. You know, when you think of Trinidad and Tobago, you, the first thing you think about is not oil. The first thing you think about is, is Calypso, Steel Pine Carnival, and then you start thinking about the food, or you think about how we speak. The same thing with Jamaica. You think about reggae. You think about jerk chicken, Barbados. You think about flying, you know? So, like, all of those things are artistic things, and th that, that, that makes them the identity of our societies. And so for them to really thrive and survive and, and evolve the same way 
the making of a steel pan has evolved generation to generation so that we don't not still play in this pipe, the Spider-Man ping pong from 1945, is that it has to be taught. Um, and if it's not taught in schools, there should definitely be some sort of institution that creates this um, um, master and apprenticeship type program that allows for people who have the interest to learn. So yeah, that would answer that question. Thank you. Uh, Edwin Hubble. Um, now we've got, now we've got, you talked a little bit about how music now can be put on Spotify and Apple and all this stuff. But there seems to be a, a resurgence of vinyl. So for some reason, you know, I see like uh, all these little white kids are now, now preferring vinyl in this digital space. Um, from the position that you sit, are you, are you seeing a resurgence in vinyl, number one? And number two, how has this new way of selling music impact on your audience? Your audience is a little bit older audience who would buy a, a, a reggae gold or a soca gold. Is it impacting on them not buying as much as they used to before? Well, for one, um, the younger generation, they, they, they love the analog sound. And by loving the analog sound, they, want, they, they, they love the feel of the vinyl. Some of the kids nowadays, they just want to see the turntable. They want to tell someone, oh, I got a turntable. I have a record collection and stuff like that. And you're finding, like, last week, there was a kid no more than about uh, seven years old came into the store with his mom. His mom said he saved up his money to come to buy a Bob Marley record because he loved, he loved um, One Love. So we sold him the One Love album, which is the best of Bob Marley. And it was around $20 for this LP. Now, it costs a lot more to produce um, vinyl because of the wax and stuff like that. And you make a higher percentage nowadays from the vinyl. Now, in our Caribbean community nowadays, um, they're more onto the CD and digital. Everybody says, oh, I, I don't buy records no more. I, I, I download it, you know, um, because they're into the streaming, they're into the technology. But the younger generation, like the white kids and so forth, they into starting from scratch to up to now. When they get up to where we at now in technology, I mean, yes, they have the phones and the computers and everything, but they wanna they wanna start their own collection. They wanna have everything on that vinyl, so they could so they could, I guess maybe trade it one day because the as you also know, the, they got some vinyl collectors. Um, that will sell a 45 for all maybe six, $700 because of the analog sound. And a lot of people love the original press. So vinyl is the biggest market right now in Europe, it's huge. Vinyl take over CD and it's about, I would say right now in the music industry, vinyl is about, um, I would say, 70% of the music industry right now. Oh, well, but, but are, who is buying the vinyl? The people of color or the white and Asian kids? The white and Asian kids are buying the, the vinyl. Wow. Okay, Allison, how are you doing? I'm good, just had to unmute my mic. I'm good, I'm good, David. Okay, good. So I've got a, my question for you is, is a, maybe a two or three part question. Um, you are in the genre of soca music. You're the queen of soca. You have traveled far and there all over the place. Um, but now, you know, the islands are very small. And when I say very small, Jamaica has about 2.5, nearly 3 million people trained at 1.5. Barbados has about 250 to 300,000 people. You can go to Montserrat maybe with 5,000 people. The islands are very small. When you think of the Spanish market, right? When you think of the, of the African market, the Afrobeats market, it's very small. 
uh, 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 an African artist that is not known can put out a, a, a record on, on YouTube and get 10 million, 50 million views because of the amounts of the numbers of people that live and reside in Africa in comparison. Now, you talked earlier about wanting to hold on to your genre of music, but still you want to get it out there, right? You want to get it out there. So yeah. you, want to, you, you want to entangle with some of these African artists, with some of these Spanish artists, with some of these artists who has a, a, a wider platform to play in, but also you want to make sure and hold on to your soca music and make sure that it's authentic, that they would want to come to you to get some of your authentic soca music. How do you do it? Um, I, that has a lot to do with networking, I believe. Um, and not only networking, but having, uh, as you so rightly uh, mentioned when you spoke, David, having actual management and not a booking agent. Management, if you have management, you have a manager, management team, whatever. Um, part of their job is, is career development, is artist development. They're supposed to be going out there and, and not only you doing what you do as the artist, creating music and looking at that side of it, but that also falls under the, the part of, of, your man, of your management to go out there and go after these things and reach out and create opportunities, look for opportunities. Um, and then for us as the artists, it's really connecting and networking um, with these artists. I have actually been um, talking to Stoneboy out of Ghana. And um, he is, he's a huge fan of mine, which is crazy. And um, he loves, he loves soca music. Um, but soca is not known in, in the continent of Africa, far less more Ghana, um, Nigeria, you know, these, these countries. I mean, the countries alone are huge. Um, so we're actually working on doing a collaboration together because I understand getting into that market um, and collabing with a major artist within that market will can absolutely make a difference. I was in Ghana twice last year. Uh, first time was actually to perform for the Ghana Music Awards, which is the, the equivalent of the, 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 the Grammy Awards for Ghana. And um, so it was a who's who of top uh, Ghanaian African artists. And um, the second time I went was to actually film, uh, to do my first film, um, my second film, sorry, uh, Joseph. And we shot in Barbados, Jamaica, and in Ghana. And um, just being there and understanding how huge that market is and how huge the Latin American market is, uh, it, it, it is networking. It is getting out there and, and, and just going for it, you know, almost, it's almost like, it, like hustling for it, but not in the way that you just trying to grab at everything making sure that you make real connections, put yourself out there and make those things happen. Um, because it's not going to happen just kind of resting back and saying, well, you know, I'm in the Caribbean and I'm going to put out music online and somebody's going to hear it and somebody's going to see the video. And that's not how things work. It has to be with purpose and with intent and you have to go out there and get it. Wow. Um, Anne Marie, so can you can you ask? Uh, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to, to ask some of the questions that are coming in, and then well, I'll come back and ask so some much. more. Um, we are almost to the end of our time. We promised our guests that we were gonna take an hour and a half of their busy schedule on a Saturday evening, and we're at 5:25 p.m. Um, we do have one more representation to take this, um, or executive director of international education, just to round out the program, but. Um, this my chat is burning up with questions and so here's a question that has just come in i don't know uh please panelists feel free to to just grab this whomever um one says uh has the how has the pandemic 
how, how has the pandemic affected your work to date? Um, and one could make that into a two part question, which is your work as a performer in terms of your access to onstage performances and, um, and how it has affected retail sales. Um, Edwin, if you could, if both of you, Alison and Edwin could give a, a quick one second on that. Yeah, um, for sure it has, well, of course my, my performances went from lots of performances down to zero in zero, zero point two seconds. It was like whew, that quick. Um, so I've taken the opportunity when we're in lockdown just to kind of, just to kind of vibe, just to kind of rock back for a little bit because I hadn't had that opportunity. And now, um, Barbados is one of the, the, the countries that is pretty open where hotels are still closed and we're still, you know, we're just getting flights coming in. Um, but I haven't been able to travel at all. No artist has really been able to travel to do anything. Um, because we can't have large crowds. Um, but we have had uh, some perform live, live shows here in Barbados. So I've actually had the opportunity to perform at home for my local market, which has been fun. The crowds are very small, obviously, because of physical distancing and protocols, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's still great to be able to be on a stage in front of a live audience. Uh, but I have been doing quite a few virtual performances, paid virtual performances, might I say. Um, and <laughs> and um, that actually has been working quite well. I have my musical director, he uses Ableton and we have, you know, a really good setup. So we we're able to, I'm able to perform, dress up and perform in my house, <laughs> you know, doll up and make up and in the middle of my house and I can make as much noise as I want and perform for people. So that is looking like it is, you know, this is the new normal and this is where things are gonna be. We don't know for how long. So we have to adapt. We have to adjust as live performers and then, you know, take it from there and see where it goes. But that's what's been, that's what's been happening. And I'm embracing it and I'm also looking at other ways that I can expand my brand into beauty and, you know, different, different directions outside of entertainment. All right. Thank you. Edwin, quickly. Well, on the retail aspect of it, um, my store was closed for about um, a little over a year during a renovation. And we recently opened back up um, back uh, 4th of July weekend. So we kind of not really in the pandemic part with the retail part of it, but the wholesale part of the business has taken um, a slump because a lot of stores has been closed and stuff. You know, if we have 500 stores we sell to now, that is cut to now to maybe a third. But so many businesses have gone out of business and due to the fact that we can't put out as much albums now because we want to have the participation of the artists coming to help promote the albums and stuff like that. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to try and sneak one more question in. I think my tech producer is waving frantically to say we have one more thing and we ought to be respecting people's time and not to be stereotypically being Caribbean people's time, which is really not on time. So I don't know. This is for um, Professor... Copeland, as well as um, Etienne, the emergence and evolution of soca music as a subculture contributed to the decline in popularity of steel pan music and by extension Calypso. Is this something that you would agree, disagree, or, or have a quick debate on? Um, over to you, PVC Copeland, and then I'm inviting um, Etienne to make a brief comment on the customer, on the, the, the question. Thank you, for Rachel G, for submitting your question. Okay, I kind of um, responded to that in the chat. I, I, I don't think it's totally responsible. I think um, David kind of hit on the, the map there when he spoke about the business of music. I don't think um, panels, especially traditional ones, really will focus on that up to, until probably in the last decade or so. And that was where the, the problem came. So whereas Calypso uh, made a paradigm shift to Suka, um, and, um, and that grabbed it probably because it, it was a crowd puller, basically. Um, uh, the pan was not able to, to continue. I, when I grew up, pan was everything in fed Sunday night. I mean, I grew up in a mass house, as I said, we'd go um, Sunday night, 
perfect, and then out on the road Monday morning, pan all the way. But um, that changed very quickly um, once sound systems got in there, you know, big pong, you know, as we say, um, and the crowds got into that. Uh, pans could not compete with that, that's one. And then secondly, um, the, the, the pan performance did, didn't change. Um, I took a, it, took, it took a lot of energy to convince um, on some small bands, big bands, to, to change their, their, their profile, to change their, their, their business model. It took a long time for that, for that to happen. Um, some, some realized it and did it. But in performance, um, the band we have, Rhapsody, was actually a small band that took the fire, changed their, their whole music profile. Um, or portfolio, I'm sorry. So so I, 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 it's, it's not one reason, it's not Soka per se, but Soka perhaps was the, the channel through which that um, the, the pan sort of starts to start to slip to the cracks. It's the end. One minute before I get booted off the set. All right. So really quickly, before I answer that question, I'll just say as a performer as well that, yeah, I lost a bunch of shows, but now because I live in Michigan, shows are starting back. Like we have venues that are open now and um, I have bookings coming in for fall and I have, I've developed a virtual platform for my own shows. So look out for Creole Soul TV. have to get that off. Um, with respect to that question, it's so many layers. Um, the one point in history that a lot of people forget about is that the steel bands went on strike. I think it was 1979 was the year and there was no panorama. And as a result, it was immediate. It was like, because normally steel bands ran the road. Steel bands and brass bands ran the road, right? And then um, with the advent of the turntable and DJs, DJs, once the steel bands weren't going to be on the road, the mass leaders, the band leaders, called their DJ friends. And that's when DJs kind of took over the road. Because of the sound systems being able to play louder than steel pans, then the mass bands got bigger. And once the mass bands got bigger, they were like, well, we don't really, we don't really need the steel band because you can't hear it. But now we have the hard pong. So it, it's part technological, it's part capitalist, because it's a lot cheaper to pay one person to spin than to pay 20 people, 30 people, um, or to try to figure out a way to amplify the steel band. Um, so with respect to the music, I think steel bands have gone back now to playing the popular song. I think in the 90s and early 2000s, you had the advent of what we call the pan tune. You know, people like Oba Sinet and people like Boogsy Sharp would com compose tunes specifically for Panorama, um, Happy Williams, and so many great composers. And that's kind of going back down now, um, especially with the advent of what we call Groovy Soca. So a lot of steel bands are, you know, a lot of like, especially like um, uh, Exodus and Rennie Gades and um, All Stars are playing popular songs because they want to have a chance to win. And if you look at the, the last few years of Panorama winners, they've almost all played popular songs. So it's a lot more nuanced than just if it was Soka versus Calypso. I think that it was a combination of a few things that were really nuanced and woven together to create this really strange sore muscle in the carnival that I hope we can fix. Um, but I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much. Um, we are, I've gotten three wrap up signals and I just, again, I just want to thank our audience wherever they are and for listening and for participating. We can't thank our panelists enough, but more importantly, or just as important, we want to just present, bring to this part of the program our executive director for international education for, at Empire State College. This is Francesca Cicello, and um, she's the genius behind much of what you see here. So, Francesca, um, I, I, I think I stole about four minutes of the time. <laughs> well, this I, we wish that this could go on all evening. I, I'd love to thank all of you um, for being here tonight, and of, of course, all of our participants. Um, I represent State University of New York Empire State College, and we are so proud to be partners and collaborators uh, with the University of the West Indies. And in so many ways, the best of what we do as educational systems, um, we are mighty in New York and in the Caribbean, but we are better together. And, uh, and we come together to produce um, these educational and cultural programs that we hope uh, really enrich and, um, and push out the, um, the intellectual and, and musical and cultural diversity of who we are. And I think we've seen that this evening and I'm just so proud. And, um, and I think in this time, of course, uh, where we are all separated, I'm, I'm also reassured that we all come together in this digital format 
to celebrate who we are, what we do best, and, uh, and to, to spread um, the magic uh, and the ingenuity of, of the music of the Caribbean to New York and the rest of the world. Um, what a wonderful evening and thank you to each of you, uh, to, your, to the artists, to the innovators, to the educators who bring this, uh, this amazing cultural diversity to the world. Thank you. Stay well, everybody. Be safe. And God bless. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Nice meeting you all. Likewise. Thank you. I, oh Lord, I, hey, I, good Lord. Everybody, let me see you clap those hands. Come on, and let me see you clap those hands. Everybody, let me see you clap those hands. Come on, and let me see you clap those hands. I tell you I have it. Hey. Tell you I have it. I tell you I have it, Lord. Tell you I got it. Hold oh, on, Lord. I am a real carnival to bank up. What kind of ball to bank up? As soon as carnival done this year, when I just start getting fever. When the doctor comes, they diagnose me. Tell me why the world is not taking it. It's just delusions and delusions. I've been thinking, so can you help me? Every time I hear a police siren, I'm thinking this is God. Coming to take me to the next venue, so my performance will not be short. When I see a big truck in front of Spain, thinking it's out of this. It's a big dumb truck passing with red sand in it. Lord, I tell you how it Hey, tell you how I tell you how I Lord. Tell you how I yeah. Everybody, let me see you clap those hands. Come on, and let me see you clap those hands. Everybody, let me see you clap those hands. Come on, and let me see you clap those hands. Jumping on the road we tried The with my woman I'll be right inside All the friends and them from outside Who from down town who from south side I'm just jumping with the man in the road I'll call in me and it cold When them girl them bumpers are roll Man them again bumpers to hold Well any time I go out and find something All I see is Juve When the blue devils them bumper I'm in the block in the road to get play And when I see a big truck in Port of Spain Thinking it's drive on this 